the uniform always looks sharp. I was always just staring at their pictures like, man, that uniform looks sharp. I go, one day, maybe I might wear one. <laughs> mm -hmm. My name is Robert Sarch Bettis. Um, I was born in East Los Angeles, uh, August 4th, 1975. I served in the Army National Guard between uh, December 30th, 2003 to December 29th, 2015. And what rank did you get out of? Uh, E5 Sergeant. E5 Sergeant. And what job did you sign up to do? I was an 88 Mike motor transport operator. Born in East Los, uh, it was... Uh, <laughs> It was, it was the, the, the normal way of life for what I understood uh, growing up in the barrio and just, uh, you know, you, you would see everybody cruising on Whittier Boulevard on Friday nights and, you know, the gang element was always popping around and, you know, always doing things. And the, my, my grandma would call them the Cibarruenzas up and down the streets and then the calles, pata perra and all that. But uh, I, I uh, it was just part of the, 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 the normal way of life for me. I didn't know anything other than East Los Angeles. And, um, you know, that, that was just the culture back then. And you tolerated it. You tolerated the, the gangs, the bullying, the, you know, ditching school, going to ditching parties and, you know, get, getting into little fights and stealing marbles and playing with G.I. Joes and all that. Everything was, was a simple time back in the 80s, man. Mm -hmm. did, you, uh, uh, did you have run-ins with gangs while you were growing up? Well, it's kind of funny because when my upbringing was... I had three different sides of families. So my grandparents were where I got all the nurturing and love. That's kind of who I spent majority of my time with. Uh, my mother and my stepdad, uh, they were more of the gang element already. Uh, that was already introduced in my life at a very early age. And then my real father, who is a Christian man, goes to church, very, very business oriented. So I kind of got a mix of everything. Um, so, you know, being around the gangsters, that they're family members. My stepbrothers, my cousins, uncles. <laughs> so it was kind of a normal thing, you know, hey, that's that's Uncle Chuy and that's, you know, that's Uncle Pablo or whoever, you know. Yeah. They're, they're just, they're always going to be, uh, you know, around kicking it with the homies. So yeah. that's just something that you embraced. Mm -hmm. It was family. Right, yeah, but it's, uh, like you said, it's part of the culture. Um did you ever get jumped in a gang at all? No, no, I, I, I they knew better because uh, of my stepdad. Uh, mm -hmm. He was from a, a big gang in, in Lincoln Heights, and you know, really nobody really messed with me mm -hmm. to that extent. Um, a lot of respect uh, for my parents. Uh, they pretty much, we didn't have those kind of issues. <laughs> okay. And was was uh, was your stepdad, was he like more of like, hey, I don't want you being part of the, this, you know, getting jumped in. You know what? He, he, he used to tell me, he goes, you, you, cause I was like the middle ch kid. Cause he had his two sons with us. And then it was me and my little brother. So he's like, you're, you're different. You're special. You're, you're going to go to school. You're going to do something with your life. You don't, you don't want any, none of this. So he always gave me guidance. He was like a good mentor. I mean, not the greatest, but at the same time, he didn't want me getting caught up in that lifestyle. What inspired you to join the army? Well, my, on my father's side, on the Beta side, um, my grandfather served in World War II, also Army. Uh, he was a scout. Uh, he was in uh, Omaha Beach. And then uh, out of his 17 kids, Uncle Freddy was three-time combat veteran, Vietnam Army. Uncle Danny was a uh, combat veteran, uh, Desert Storm, and Vietnam. So he actually served in Vietnam with the Army, and then he transitioned into the Air Force and with Desert Storm. Uh, graduated and got out and retired as a first sergeant. Uh, Uncle Joel, uh, Marine Corps veteran, he was peacetime. Uh, Uncle Rick was military intelligence, peacetime. And then until we got into the cousins, uh, myself, uh, a couple of my other cousins were in the Navy. Uh, they, they did like the six-month tours overseas. Um, I had some cousins that kind of got in trouble, got kicked out of the military for, you know, popping hot and, and AWOL and all that other stuff. I maintained... But it, it and then mom's side, um, grandpa was a, a cook in the army. Uh, Uncle Uncle Edward was a Marine in Vietnam. Uh, Uncle David was a, a Navy uh, in the Navy, but he was peacetime. And then he got trouble in the Philippines. But that we had an over sense of both sides of my family was very heavy on military service. Wow. So I always respected that. Yeah. The uniform always looked sharp. I was always just staring at their pictures like, man. And the uniform was sharp. I go, one day, maybe I might wear one. <laughs> mm -hmm. So you knew you wanted the Army? Not not at first. Um, kind of joined at 28. I, I didn't go in at 
an early age like everybody else. So, um, but Army was my first choice. Yeah. What it, what what made you decide to go in at such a uh, uh, later age? Well, I was already married to my first wife. Uh, she had three kids, and we ended up having two kids together. Um, I was working two different jobs. I had I was working at a, a pistachio processing plant, and and then I ended up uh, having a little part time ma night manager for a pizza place in Delano, California. So I always wanted to do more for my family. I always had that itch to get involved and do something with my life. And and then of course you know after 9/11, I started seeing everybody joining and signing up. And I was like, well, you know, I was 25 at the time, 26. I said, you know what? I go, it, why not, you know? And my first wife was like, oh, you're too old. You're not going to make it. You're not, you're dumb and this and that. And so I uh, I took the ASVAB and I failed it. I got a 30. I missed it by one point, man, for infantry. And uh, I was like, damn it. So the recruiter goes, here, take this book. It says the ASVAB in 30 days. Man, I after I do that job in the, the pizza place, I was stepping to like 2 in the morning studying that damn book for a whole month. When I went back, I scored a 50 on my ASVAB. I got in. So I was like, mm. And I didn't say nothing to my wife. I didn't say nothing. I was like, I kept it quiet. Didn't say nothing. A recruiter took me down to, for my, uh, down to MEPS in LA and did my, I swore in, took the oath. Then I told her, I made it. I did it. What? I'm like, she was shocked. I'm like, what, what? I studied all those nights. I studied and I studied. Even you told me I wasn't going to make it. I did it and then encouraged me to finish. So that's that's what I did. I, I push. I had to motiv learn to motivate myself to do it. Yeah, at that age. Wow. Now, um, what was your recruiter experience like? Did you get to pick your job, or how how did that? He actually gave me some options. Um, it was a toss up between the infantry, um, military police, and eighty eight Mike, which is a motor transport operator. So I always thought, well, you know what, infantry. I don't know. I mean, maybe we'll think about it, but I, I don't want to be a cop. <laughs> I just, they, they kind of like, yeah, you know, my, my family members, it didn't really, cops didn't really blend in well with the family. <laughs> so I said, you know what, what's, what's the harm in driving a truck? I could drive a truck. You know, I used to drive you all the time, moving family out, you know, Hey, Mijo, can you help me move my stuff? Yeah, I got you. You know, I'll be the U-Haul guy. You know, I had to, I'm the only one that had a legit license so I could rent it. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, I picked I picked a motor transport operator because I just I thought all I was gonna do was drive a truck. Um, what was your boot camp experience like? Oh man, Fort Jackson, South Carolina. Uh, they call it relaxing Jackson because they say it's the easiest thing in the world, and they're all. Uh, I, I didn't I didn't, I disagree because I was Delta Company 260th Infantry. I remember my drill sergeants. I, I had Drill Sergeant Butler and Drill Sergeant Pickney, and Dan and Drill Sergeant Chisholm. They were fucking rough man were they? They, they i could i could never forget them i could never forget them i actually bought i was the only guy in my my unit to buy the actual cadre picture mm -hmm. <laughs> i was like i ain't buying that shit i don't fucking want to see them but i something said to purchase it because i wanted to keep something that reminded me of where my discipline was instilled who was responsible so i always remember those guys those those drill sergeants you got any stories from boot camp well, being 28 years old in boot camp with a bunch of 18, 19 year olds was fucking an eye opener. Um, I, I, I kind of took on the fatherly role in a sense after these guys kept making us push our face and, and for stupid shit. And one night I got up, I go, you know what? You guys need to knock your shit off because this is getting, this is, this is fucked up. You guys need to stop. You need to stop. I go, if you want your privileges, we need to start doing this, 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 and this. So that's where I kind of got the, the leadership role in a sense as a PFC because I came in as a PFC. And uh, I took, I right away, I was already like the highest ranking guy there. Everybody was like an E1, E2. And I was like, look, knock your shit off. Let's get this done. Stop fucking around. Or we're not going to get smoked. So then they started calming down. And, and then they started seeing guys getting popped for gambling in the restroom. And they would get caught. Article 15s, they're done. And I would tell the guys, you see that shit? Don't be like that. So I kind of, kind of motivated them to do the right thing and stop getting in trouble. So the rest of our weeks could be easier. So that was about 10 and a half weeks reception. It, it looked fucking nice because they, they had the lobster tails and steaks. I'm like, oh, man, this is this is shit. I didn't even get this at home. And uh, now until you get on that damn bus, 
And I'll never forget Joe Sergeant Chisholm. He's on the bus. He's telling us, put your heads down. So we put our heads down. Don't look up. Keep your head down. The whole way, because I guess they don't want you to recon away to escape. So we get off with the bus. As soon as the fucking bus stop, doors open. Get the fuck off my bus. Get off my bus. And then he's just like, and then you can see the veins pulsating in his neck. And I was like, what the? F-? And then everyone starts rolling. And, and like maybe eight or nine guys break their ankles coming off the bus. And people are getting trampled on, run over. I mean, they're, they're telling you, throw your, your duffel bags over there. They're throwing all your shit. And then they play this game where you're, uh, go grab your shit, hang it over your head, stand at attention, blah, blah, blah. And, and I'm like, what the fuck is going on? And I'm thinking to myself, I'm fucking dumb. What did I, what did I do? <laughs> It was rough. It was it was an eye opener. Yeah, I bet. Especially being twenty eight, and you're at a pretty, you know, most of the guys are. I'm assuming eighteen, nineteen. Yeah, you're you're like a you know matured ten years over that. You know what I mean? <laughs> and this this one drill sergeant goes, "Come here, you." I'm like, "How old are you?" Twenty eight, drill sergeant. I thought so. Get your ass away from me. I was like, "The fuck was that about?" Like, we were, it turns out we were the same age. Oh wow! So towards the ending of that uh, boot camp, he calls me. He goes. PSC Perez, front center. I'm like, yes, Joe Sergeant. goes, come in here. So I, we went into that one room where you're not allowed to walk in. That's the cadre room. He goes, all right, relax. And I'm looking at him like, Joe Sergeant goes, relax. We're the same age. This is just the shit we have to do just to kind of keep you guys motivated and disciplined. But it's just play along with it. You'll be, you'll do fine, bro. Like, mm-hmm. and he shook my hand. I was like, the fuck? Like, am I going to get smoked for shaking his hat? Or, right. It's like, no. And I was like, Oh shit! Just a, it's all a mental mind game. I'm like, okay, Roger that. So that kind of stood in my head. Like, wherever I ended up, it's all part of the process. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they're conditioning you to become a war fighter, really, right? Oh yeah. Um, so yeah, talk to me about your military experience, man. After boot camp, what'd you get into, and what was your experience like? So after getting out, I went to my first National Guard unit, the 184 Infantry in Fresno, California. I get there and I'm thinking everything's going to be like active duty, right? Like I'm all like pressed to the uniform, spit shine black boots. I walk in and all these guys are like, oh, look at here. We got a new boot. I'm like, yeah, I mean, hey, what's going on? Staff Sergeant, nah, relax. We don't do that shit here. I'm like, the fuck? I'm like, so I, I stayed at parade rest. I'm like, no, nah, I'm not going to, because I remember a drill sergeant telling me, never compromise your standards for nobody, no matter who they are or what they are. You go to you'll, the, you'll go end up at a unit. They might have relaxed standards, never compromise your standards. So I, I always carry that to this day where I don't do that. And I was just like, the f-? these guys are like older guys and like way older than me. And I was like, wow, okay. So like, so what do we, what kind of training are we doing? Ah, we ain't doing shit today. I'm like, okay. So I was like, cool. So then I think around July, I, I graduated May 28, 2004. That was both boot camp and AIT. I went to Fort Leonard with uh, uh, Fort Leonard, Missouri. When I got out, I think by July 29, the governor Schwarzenegger had cut our orders for Operation Iraqi Freedom. So I was already attached to the 2668 transportation unit out of Sacramento, and I was supposed to report to Camp Roberts, and that was it. And that's how we knew we were getting mobilized to go to Iraq. Wow. So it was like that, I didn't even have a break really. Wow. So what, 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 uh, how did you feel about that? What was going I was pumped. I was pumped up because I, I said, cause I really knew the Iraq war had just started in March. And I'm like, all right, cool. Right on. Like, damn, I'm, I'm going to go to war. Like I, 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 all I could think was my grandfather is telling me about combat and being in the military and world war two. And that, that moment when I got my orders, I was thinking, I'm I'm gonna go to the sandbox. I'm I'm gonna be a part of something. I'm gonna be a part of history. So I was actually I think I liked it too much because this was something other than being in East Los Angeles, being married with kids and whole different ballpark. And I, I kind of embraced it. I was like I, I couldn't wait to go. I couldn't wait. What'd your family think? They didn't like it. My mom was pissed. My stepdad was like dude, what the fuck? Like, why are you going to go fight some other man's war and this and that? I'm like, hey, Hefe, we're, we're good. You know, don't don't trip. I got this. And one thing he did tell me, he goes, well, you know what I mean, I love you. I don't agree with it, but you go over there, you stay safe, and you come back with your pulse. I'm like, okay, <laughs> yeah. And I didn't understand what he meant by that, but 
basically that that kind of helped me to survive during that deployment that 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 heartfelt talk that i had with him and um i was very grateful for that so when you get activated um as a res reserve unit before actually going over to iraq um is there an activation period before you actually come together and go over there? Like, do you train for a month or two or do any kind of work? Yeah, actually, uh, Fort Lewis, uh, Washington, uh, a mob site for three months. Mm. So that's where we transitioned from BDUs to the desert DCUs. Mm. And I was like, holy shit, this is really happening. So we were there and that mob site, you're, you're trained. We were trained to just do convoy operations in a sense, but... For some reason, they were like, all right, we need some people to go to the 50 cal range to qualify. And I, I remember what the 50 cal was during, you know, weapons call. I'm like, fuck, that's a heavy weapon. I ain't messing with that shit. And then, of course, being the PFC E3, the staff sergeant goes, all right, Perez, you're going. I'm like, oh, no, 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 I, I'm good. Staff sergeant, I don't, I don't, I'm, I'm cool, man. I'm, no, you're already on the list. You're, you're gone. I'm like, fuck. So I went to uh, go qual on the 50 and, I, I I saw this fucking huge piece of machinery. I was like, "What the fuck, man? This is it's heavy. It's it looks big. It looks complicated. I don't even know if I want to tear this down and clean it." And I was like, <laughs> "Fuck, man!" And then the minute I shot it, I it's like something connected. Like I was like, "Ooh, like oh, I I like this." <laughs> so then I called expert, and man, I was like, I fell in love with it. I was like. This is my new best friend. He felt that power. Behind. Yeah. And it was a trip because I was like, like, this is, this is awesome, man. Like to have that experience to operate a 50 cal, the mod deuce. And wow. Um, so talk to me about that deployment. What was it like going to Iraq that first time to you? Hot and ugly is the best I could describe it. Um, I always remember the smell, burning trash, burning tires, um, sometimes he would smell carne asada, but it wasn't, it was just a dog falling into the burn pit. We were really close to the burn pits. Um, a lot of, lot, like a lot of odd, funky smells. Um, and of course being an, on a gun truck crew, you know, protecting convoys from getting messed around with our rules and engagements were pretty, pretty straightforward. Like, Hey, you know, you guys on the road, um, you're gonna, you're gonna go out there. You're gonna escort these feelers up and down Iraq. And basically rules of engagement were you're going to come in and they already know this. So if a vehicle's coming into your, your, your lane, convoys have the right away. You have to front gunner has to flag them down three times. So they pull over and keep going. At that time, you had a lot of, uh, VI, V beds, uh, vehicle borne improvised explosive devices, car bombs, basically that where they would just come in and come into the convoy and try to blow the convoy to stop operations. So our job was to engage and keep them from messing with our convoys. Joe, did you ever experience any of those? It, 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 it was a lot of chaos, man. Mm -hmm. um, especially with at night, because all of our some of our missions were at nighttime. Mm -hmm. So it's like test firing is one thing. Actually laying down rounds into a vehicle is another thing. Mm -hmm. And that's something that you I'll never forget. You never forget. It, it, it's a part of you for life. It, it changes you as a person. I threw up. I threw up the first time, and it. I remember the the guys in the in the gun truck were like, "Oh, virgin," and I was like, "The fuck? I'm like, what do you mean? I'm sick. Like, I don't feel good. This is to sit right with me." But uh, I remember uh, this one time we were in. I had the MEGs on, and the convoy was halted. We were halt. We stopped for like two hours, um, and I remember. There was a Black Hawk was trying to uh, evac a, a soldier, but there was this insurgent. He was shooting at the Black Hawk. And all you see is the Black Hawk just unload. And then there's nothing. You don't see anything. You don't hear nothing. And there's trucks on fire. I guess we had just missed the aftermath. And once everything was cleared, we rolled by. I'll never forget. There was a truck that was on fire. It smelled like, like, like bad meat and copper and plastic. And there was, it looked like the driver was fused in with the seat, burnt up. 
and I, I remember that that smell like I I can't I could still it's still there and uh I, I just I was like fuck man that that's that's crazy like that was my first time I seen something like that charred a person charred up and it just uh you know it, it, it stays with you it stays with you yeah what kind of uh uh what was your guys's task out there uh, in Iraq a lot of it at first was just gun truck escort um making sure we're protecting convoys from insurgents trying to take our shit or disrupt the convoys and then towards the ending of the deployment if there wasn't any really missions to do they did a lot of perimeter security um you take a work detail out to go build some stuff um guard tower duty i mean they were always constantly changing your shit but majority of the time was going on missions running convoys from i remember we went to a place called camp duke uh it was in ooh, it was like i remember seeing this like river and they had these big old piles of salt and you went all the way up and then i guess that was the euphrates i'm, I'm unsure but once you get up to the top of the hill there was camp duke it was off to the left they, they took it down but i remember it was my very first uh i saw the marine it was a marine corps base and they had a, like the child was like not even established like you could just tell it was like the beginning stages of iraq and the the shitters were different they weren't as nice as they are you know as they as they got more modern throughout the years but it was it was pretty harsh uh pretty uh rough conditions uh no ac no no armor on the vehicles at that time everything was sandbags on the floor and then they started introducing the hillbilly armor which had no purpose whatsoever to protect you especially if you're a gunner on the top so like your body's exposed i'm like Psh. It, it, it didn't even make a it didn't even matter yeah um how long were you in iraq for that first uh that one was a full uh 12 12 months boots on ground oh. one year deployment um yeah that was so i think it was a total of 15 months with the mold the actual deployment and then the demold which was like two weeks so yeah it was, it was as long as i've been away from my family wow um did you communicate uh, with the family while you're out there, Ada? yeah, I mean, I, I would, I they they had these little AT and T phone cards that you would call, you you go to the AT and T call center, and I mean, the, it was it was like a little one two second delay, but at least you were able to ha hi bye, I'm good, and I'll, I'll talk to you later. I didn't really call uh, like I should have. I didn't really call my mom because my mom would get like think the worst shit, and she ended up breaking out in hives because she would watch the news and. She was seeing soldiers getting obliterated and she thought it was me. And I was like, so she broke up in highs really bad. And then one day I, I called her, go, hey, mom, um, oh, where are you? Like, oh, no, you know, just got into some shit and this and that. And she, she's freaking out. And I'm like, I'm fine. You know, I'm, I'm cool. I'm like, I'm all right. But um, I, I talked to my stepdad. I talked to my mom. I would call friends, family when I could, you know, hey, I'm, home. I'm okay. I'll be coming home soon. Don't, don't worry. And then that was pretty much it. I made my sergeant out there. Um, it was kind of weird because I was already a PFC and I guess my promotion to E4, it, it, it was on paper, but they didn't promote me to E4 specialist. So it was weird. Like I was still getting paid E3 and I was like, what the hell? Here's my promotion orders. Why don't they want to do it? Oh, because it looks like you're going to make rank real quick. Well, that's not my fault. And like the hell, you know, that's, that's how it works, I guess. Mm -hmm. And, uh, then one day, March was March 1st, 2005. The squad leader calls me over and goes, hey, Perez, come here. He goes, is this you? Is this your social? I'm like, yeah. It was or sergeant orders. My promotion for E5 came in. He goes, well, this says you're at E5. You're a sergeant now. Congratulations. I'm like, oh, so do I get pinned? Well, the unit didn't want to pin me because, again, it was going to look like I made my sergeant in my first under my first two years, and it looked bad. What? Well, somebody had put in a waiver for me because I was going above and beyond the scope of what I was doing, I was kind of making other NCOs look bad at the time. Uh, the initiative, the just being a little bit older, more mature, I kind of I respected it more like a like a job. Like, hey, this is my duty. This is what I got to do. And I guess somebody put it in. I ended up getting promoted. So I took my own sergeant orders down to finance. I went in PTs. They took my picture. I had my ID card that says Sergeant Perez, and um, I I basically squared away my own pay. <laughs> so that's how I learned to start doing things for myself and the true value of really taking care of your soldier. Cause that squad leader could have done it. 
he didn't do it, he, whatever the reason was. So I squared myself away. And from that for, day forward, anybody that had a promotion order come in and they were under my care, I made sure that they got taken taken care of properly. Mm -hmm. Nice. Um, did you guys used to, uh, uh, you know, during your downtime, you know, I, I know, you know, in combat, there's a lot of downtime, a lot of boredom. Um, do you have any stories about what you would do? Yeah, the, yeah, we had, uh, we had all the movies from home. So we watched American Me, Blood In, Blood Out. We had Mi Vida Loca. We, we had, we made movie nights, man. We, we were drinking, uh, Miller Sharps. It was the non-alcoholic beer that they gave us with our class C. And, you know, I had a little mini fridge. It was a two man hooch at the time. So my buddy, who's now my compadre, uh, we all, all the guys from, from LA would get together and we all come to my hooch. And we'd watch American Me, all the prison movies, all the gang movies. Yeah. So we kind of, you know, we kind of had the elements of home. Uh, they would send us care packages for big cans of menudo. So we would have a spread of menudo on wow, Sundays. Really? Uh, and kind of just kind of take the, the ease off of where you're at. And, hey, menudo Sunday, come on over, bro. I'm like, oh, okay, cool. And you know, it was canned menudo, hey. hey. But we had the menudo mix. We had tapatio. We had, you know, we couldn't have tortillas or nothing like that. But we had like the the lemon juice, the lime juice. So we had all that and we have the microwave. So we just do it in little portions and heat up the bowls and here you go, man. Wow. Like, oh man, this is cool. And well, yeah, uh, we, we were able to make it work after the deployment when we got home. Um, Sergeant Mark Harmon, he, uh, he ended up dying of a heart attack uh, after we got back in our first sergeant. Uh, he was diagnosed with colon cancer. Uh, I think three months after we got back home, they had to present his bronze star on the, in the hospital bed, right? Well, the general that was in charge, he had to present his bronze star to him. But yeah, those guys didn't make it. Uh, it was afterwards. So basically, you know, the partying and the drinking and stuff like that led to one of the heart attacks for one guy. The other one was just a misdiagnosis that they could have caught in Kuwait and they didn't. So he ended up rolling on that deployment and it. By the time he got home, it had already spread. Uh, my first sergeant, uh, first sergeant Chermilla. I'll never forget him. He was a, a prosecutor. Good man. Wow. He was an attorney, huh? Yeah, he was he was he was pretty cool, man. But I, I it was just weird. Like, you know, this is a guy that led us into Iraq and and was our first sergeant and then to find out how he went out was kind of chicken shit. Yeah. So wow. that, that was pretty rough. Now, um you did a second tour uh, to Iraq as well. Yes, uh, that one in between deployments in 06, I was home. I was working for uh, uh, Advanced Energy Systems in Delano, California. I was a heavy machine operator. I was driving a front end loader. I was working for a biomass energy plant. And I I, I mean, I really liked the 12 hour shifts. The, my, my boss was actually a Vietnam veteran. He's the one that got me the job. Uh, I got it through going to EDD after my first deployment. They say, oh, you can draw EDD. So I was trying to do that. And the lady that worked in the EDD office, she used to be my, my grandma and grandpa's uh, pharmacist at, at when it was thrifties back then, but now it's writing. And she's like, hey, Robert, what are you? I goes, oh, I just came back from deployment. He goes, what are you doing here? I go, oh, I'm supposed to draw my, get my EDD. I goes, oh, well, I think my husband's hiring. I go, oh, I, I don't want to work. I just want to draw my money and go away, you know, like we'll hide somewhere. Mm -hmm. And so she's already calling him on the phone. His name was Hank Medina. And she's like, honey, uh, I got a soldier. He just came back from Iraq. And she just gives me the phone. I never, I didn't know how this guy was. And I get the phone. He's like, welcome home. Thank you for your service. I'm like, uh, thank you. He goes, yeah, come, come on over on Monday and I'll get you hired on. I'm like, uh, oh, oh okay. <laughs> so I ended up working there and uh, they made me a permanent uh, employee. But I just, I didn't, I felt off. I felt awkward. I miss the camaraderie. I miss, I miss that war type environment. Mm -hmm. So my compadre calls me. He was like, "Hey, what are you doing?" I go, "I'm at work, bro." He's like, "How do you like it?" Ah, it's okay, man. He goes, "Hey, you want to go on another deployment?" I go, "Don't fucking don't play with me, bro." I'm like, no, I'm serious. Eleven uh, thirteen's gonna deploy. They're out of San Jose. I go, "Well, I don't have orders. Could you show up to Camp Robertson? I'll get you orders." I'm like, "Really? Fuck it. I'll, when you, where do I need to be there?" Next week, I'll be there. I packed up all my shit, and then I, I told my wife, I go, hey, um, can you take me to Camp Roberts? I'm like, why? Well, um, I volunteered for another deployment. 
She's like, what? I'm like, what do you, what do you mean? I go like, yeah, I want to go again. He goes, you, you mean, do you have to go? I go, no, I want to volunteer. It's like, what the fuck's wrong with you? Isn't it? I wasn't really, I kind of wasn't even happy where I was at with her and just a lot of little stupid shit. And that was my way out. And that was the best damn thing I ever did because that deployment for 07, 08 was a game changer. That was the one where I got to showcase my skills and talents. I was already an NCO. Um, I was able to do things and, and motivate and mentor and train. And it gave me a sense of purpose and I loved it. But then that got me into the tactical operations center. I didn't want that. I wanted to be in a line platoon. I wanted to lead these guys into battle and, and run convoys. And for the first three months, well, in the mob site, we went to uh, uh, Camp Atterbury, Indiana. For We were there for three months. And uh, it was okay. Uh, before we mobbed out, we, I had to go to a, I, we had a four day pass to Chicago. Uh, I got to drink hot cognac in the Sears Tower, got a tour of the Chicago River, got to see Soldier Field. That was cool. Partying <laughs> like crazy. Um, and then we 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 shipped out and um, we were in Camp Air of John Kuwait. And I'm thinking, well, that's not Iraq, so this is going to be pretty cool. What we didn't know is that from Air of John, you got a convoy all the way up to Iraq in different fobs and stuff. And I was like, fuck, that felt hot on driving. So we did that and uh, got, got into theater. Uh, we set up the Tactical Operations Center. I was basically the NCYC monitoring the convoys at night along with the assistant truck master. And so anytime we would get a ping on the MTS, if somebody got hit, I did all the serious incident reports, critical incident reports, relayed all that to battalion, make sure that the, the platoon sergeants and the company commander and the first sergeant were briefed before I left uh, 06 in the morning because mine was 1800 to 06. That was my shift seven days a week. And um, it was okay. Uh, but I still, being being in the talk, I didn't want to be that 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 fobbit, you know. I didn't want to be that guy that, I, well, what was your deployment? Oh, I was in a tactical operations center. I, I was like, what, what's that? Like, oh, I'm just monitoring convoys and doing reports and I didn't want that. I wanted to be in the live platoons. I wanted to be where the shit was at. I wanted to be with the guys. So I think after my third month, I pleaded and pleaded and pleaded. And I begged, please let me go to a line platoon. But um, Sergeant Paget was the ACC for third platoon under Staff Sergeant Anderson. And he was horse playing and broke his ankle. And they needed an ACC. And they didn't have anybody. So I was like, hey, Sergeant Anderson. I used to call him Chato because his name was Chadwick, but we were all Mexican. We're like, no, your name is Chato. <laughs> just call him Chato. I'm like, Chato, get, get me on, man. I go, I'd love to be a part of Third Herd. They're like, well, let me see what we can do. And then they talked. And at first, uh, the the first sergeant and the, and the motor sergeant were, no, you're staying here. I'm like, please. And then I went to Major Loveless. I went straight to the top. I go, sir, please. Let me, please, I, I won't let you down. I promise. He's like, you know what? I have faith in you, Sergeant Perez. Okay, and he signed. I'm like, holy oh, shit! So then I ran over there. I go, Chato, I'm in. I'm like, let's do it. I rolled out, man, and uh, I was able to be the enforcer. So I was in charge of the vehicles, weapons draw, supplies, making the discipline, making sure that they were washing their gold smelling asses on every convoy, conducting personal hygiene. Uh, best fucking deployment ever. I was able to. I found my niche and my goal and what I was supposed to do. My purpose was, so. Uh, Chato was in charge of uh, battalion and the paperwork and all the higher up shit. I was in charge of the overall convoy, the discipline, the vehicles, supplies, weapons, and all that. So how did that? Uh, how how did it go for you that deployment? Uh, <laughs> well, a, a lot of IEDs. I'll tell you that, man. A lot of IEDs. It, it, I mean, you had a maneuver on the main supply round Tampa was every you could you could actually see the fresh. Uh, cement liquid cement that they would put an id you could tell because it was like a really bright gray compared to the rest of the the roads so you, as convoys the lead vehicle in front of us would say hey there's a potential id here we're gonna divert uh, go. we did a lot of this kind of just serpentine stuff and uh sometimes we hit them sometimes we didn't but mo majority of the time we got hit a lot and our maintenance team we used to call them the mexicanics because they're all mexicanos mechanics and they can get a vehicle towed, recovered, 
within under 15 minutes. Wow. And it, it, they was like, hey, uh, is it salvageable? Yeah, tow it. Let's go. Can we change the tire out and get it rolling? Yeah, get it going. And within 15 minutes, anything over 15 minutes, we had to leave it because we just couldn't take the risk. So we never had to leave a, we never had to leave a vehicle. Uh, we had one of the best maintenance recoveries uh, in, in the unit. Um, I remember that entire deployment, we were able to do, I think, 7 million miles as an entire unit for that entire deployment. And we moved about four brigades in and out of theater. During the old million? 7 million miles. First National Guard unit to, in California, to, and we made the Stars and Stripes. Wow. I remember that. Wow, man. So you were there for about a year or so? And that was also 12 months. Yeah, boots on ground. Um I think the, the the hardest part about that tour was April 9th, 2008. We are in Baghdad, um, and uh, we're in Baghdad. We're getting ready to roll out BIOP. That was a FOB, and it was about 1.10 in the morning, and the roll conditions kept switching on us. So if it was red, you can't get any medevac support and can't roll out. If it's amber, it's still not good enough to roll out. When the rolls go green, then you can roll. So we were doing a lot of red, amber, red, amber, until finally around 2 o'clock in the morning, we got the green light to roll out. As soon as we rolled out, the, the rolls went black. At that time, Al Zakawi was the guy in charge uh, after Saddam, put a $1 million bounty on, on an American convoys that were out there. We were the only idiots out there at the time. So we're rolling down the southbound uh, in MSR Tampa southbound lane. We got to around 22 Alpha, 21 Alpha checkpoint, and the, they blew the first vehicle. And as soon as they blew the first vehicle, it was uh, contact left. You can see tracer rounds going around, and then you start seeing the flares popping up one by one. They're calling out IED, IED, contact left. And just, it, it looked like something out of a fucking Star Wars movie because you just seen all these red tracer rounds coming out from the left side. And you can hear it clinking on the fucking metal of the trucks. And those trucks were actually up armored. Um, we had five gun trucks that that mission uh, from the 4th Alabama Infantry. Those guys are, I fucking love them because normally you roll out with four. That day we had five just for shits and giggles. The guys wanted to get off the fob. And if it wasn't for that 5th gun truck, um, we probably would have got our asses handed to us. So when they engaged, imagine five 50 cals in that direction shooting back i think three guys were three insurgents were killed that night and they they uh they saved us so i took the remaining convoy to fob Kalsu, which is half the distance between uh biop and and scania so i took the rest of the convoy in sergeant anderson stayed they had to uh evac sergeant mathis and, and rev because sorry mathis and that was the second hit with an ied and i'm getting the purple heart for it and uh I took the rest of the convoy in, did a bad, battle damage assessment of all the vehicles, got bedding, billeting for everybody to bed them down. I couldn't sleep. I was just fucking still wired. And, um, you know, when next, um, I waited for Staff Sergeant Anderson and the rest of the guys to show up with the rest of the gun truck elements. We regrouped. Everybody uh, kind of was starting to bed down, except for some of the gun truck guys. Well, it turns out the fifth gun truck was filming the whole fucking thing. Oh, wow. He just happened to be like, oh, here we are in mission, da 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 and catches the whole fucking thing. When the IED goes up, you can see the haze. You see the flares going out. You can hear the contact left IED on, over the chatter, over the radio. And he actually had video footage. And then he shows one of the guys firing a 203 round in that direction where they were firing. And you see the, the 50 cows going off on the gun trucks. And I was like, to actually see that on video footage, it was a trip because I didn't even know anybody was filming it. Yeah. This guy just happened to be, oh, da, da, this, um, here we are in a convoy and catches the whole experience. Wow. So we were put in for the combat action badge and they were kicked back three times for the sworn statements we had to write. The fourth time we sent it, we sent a copy of the video and we were able to uh, get awarded our combat action. Why would, they, why would they kick it back? Some of the some of the guys didn't know how to write. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, some, some of these guys, I don't know if the, how they did it through high school or what, but I don't know, man. <laughs> wow. 
I mean, I, I had good quality education. I don't know about some of my other battle buddies, but they the yeah. fuck guys didn't know how to spell, or they just things didn't they, they they weren't consistent with everybody else's statements. And so by the time we just sent the damn video up, and again, uh, my very detailed report, and along with others, we were able to uh, get our combat action badges awarded. Wow! So everybody in the con, we got it. Gun trucks, uh, they got their CIBs. Um, Fourth Alabama Infantry. So I remember. After that mission, um, the next day was, we had a rollout. I didn't even get any sleep. And I was thinking to myself, I have to call home. So I got the satellite phone. I called home. I didn't even get to tell my wife what happened because she said she was going to divorce me. And uh, it, 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 I it clicked. I was like, and then uh, Chato's looking at me. He's like, what's wrong? I go, uh, I think my wife's going to divorce me, man. Yeah, I was like, it's, it was a shocker because I just wanted to hear her voice and, and tell her that, hey, you know, we got into this firefight and, you know, I'm just, I just wanted to hear your voice and, and, you know, how's everybody doing? And I didn't even get the opportunity to tell her what happened. She's just like, you know what, I'm just tired of your shit and this and that. And, you know, I'm divorcing you. And she hung up on me and I'm like on the satellite phone like, fuck. And that's when he asked me, hey, what's what's up? I go, She's my, I think my wife's going to divorce me, man. She's like, what do you want to do? I go, let's just finish the mission. When we get back to Air of John, I'll figure it out. So I remember we got back to Air of John, and I took, like back then, they had fucking signs there were three-minute showers, conserved water, blah, blah, blah. I, I didn't give a shit. I took a 20-minute shower, cold shower, and I just tried to put on a new, new, new uniform, um, I had the photo of my wife and my kids and my stepdaughters on my wall locker and I took it off the wall locker and I went down to the chaplain's office and I just walked in and I go, Hey, how you doing, sir? I go, I don't have an appointment, but, uh, I just kind of wanted to talk to somebody and he's like, Oh yeah, well, come on here. Well, what's going on? I go, so I, I give him the picture. I go, I think I just lost my family. He's like, what? And then I just started breaking down. I, 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 I just, I lost it. And then I caught myself. I'm like, fuck, hell no, shut up, drink water, change your socks. You no, know I'm sorry, sir, I didn't mean to waste your time. And I left. And the chaplain's like, oh, wait, wait. But I left. I'm like, nah, I'm, I'm gone. I, fuck this, I ain't going to do that. So Sergeant Mathis, um, he was going through the same thing two weeks prior with his wife. And he's like, he's like, battle. I go, go to JAG. Get your revocation of power of attorney. So I did that, went to JAG. And so, because it takes 10 days from mail from Iraq to get to the States, by the time the bank got it, she had already taken money out of the bank. I think she only left me with $317 in my savings account. When she went back to get that, the bank got the revocation of power of attorney. They told her no. And said, man, if we would have got this two days prior, you wouldn't have been able to take anything. So that, that right there was, it was rough because... She already knew what she wanted to do, and she had already taken everything out of the house. She wasn't paying the mortgage for three months. Uh, by the time I got home, the market, it was 2008, the market crashed. I was upside down 75000 I had dead grass. All my grass in the backyard, front yard was gone. Um, she only left me the sofa and the recliner and all my clothes hanging in my closet, and that was it. And I, I looked at the empty rooms, and I was like, fuck, this is, this is real shit. So I, I, it was hard because my welcome home was supposed to be different. Yeah. It was supposed to be like, you would see all these soldiers all oh, welcome home and they throw a big old party for you. And well, in my case, and that was the case and it, 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 it fucking sucked. It was. So you have to deal with, you know, your wife leaving you, um, and this whole financial situation. And then on top of, I, I imagine, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, um, having to deal with. Uh, you know, serving two tours in Iraq and everything that comes with the aftermath of being in combat. Um, yeah, it, about it, that. I went through a bad depression. I was a really bad alcoholic. Uh, I drank myself silly. I, I shut myself down off the grid for about a couple of years. I didn't want to talk to nobody. I was very suicidal. I tried to commit suicide four different times. Um, pills. Uh, I tried to shoot myself with the thirty-eight. Um, I tried to stab myself in the neck with a pair of scissors, which I actually 
was able to walk myself down to the Long Beach VA hospital psych ward L2 and check myself in. And they weirded, I weirded them out because they're like, you're not here by a judge or court order. I'm like, no, I'm here because I have my battle plea on the phone when he caught me when I was about to stick myself. And he's like, what are you doing? And he goes, ah, I'm going to fuck, I'm fucking done. I'm about to stab myself in the neck with a pair. He's like, don't do it, this and that. And he was my roommate in my first tour. So we, we stayed really close together. Noel Guerrero, I'll always be grateful for him. So he stayed on the phone with me until I drove all the way down to Long Beach and I checked myself into L2 and I actually surrendered the pair of scissors to the guy in the ER. And he's like, he's like, you know what the hell to do? I'm trying to do the right thing. And they're looking at me all weird. So by the time they got me checked in, I was able to do that four times. Uh, that Jeep Gladiator that I brought, I was going to drive it off a cliff because I was just tired of my situation and, you know, just financially struggling and suffering. And But then something gave me purpose. Uh, and I I, I kind of just woke up one day and said, no, my life has value and meaning. I had to find a new mission. And what was that? What's that What's that mission that you found? The, the mission was, uh, you know, I had to go back to school get my education because I always wanted to go to college. It's just my parents couldn't afford it. You know, they were, they were in the body they didn't have money. And uh, if anybody was going to do it, Uncle Sam was going to pay for it. So I was able to attain two degrees. Uh, I got my associates of science in computer networking technology at Kaplan College in Bakersfield, graduated with 3.1. And then 2016, I graduated with my master's in human resource management from DeVry University. Started the Veterans Club for two years there while I was at DeVry and had two successful missions for Veterans Day and Memorial Day Honors, where we honored veterans, faculty members. We honored two veterans that had passed away. Um, I had local elected officials come out and give out certificates of recognition and stuff like that. So I, I, that was kind of like the blueprint for what led to my nonprofit, which I started up in 2020. So after I did that, went to school, it was like, all right, go to school, do this, get a good job. Well, it wasn't that easy for a combat veteran with PTSD. So a lot of times I was told that I'm a liability. Um, we don't really, we don't really have anything for combat vets. And, uh, you know, and then of course I had to change when I was at DeVry, I had to change out my email. So, you know, you, when you have a, a Gmail that says combat killer 75, no one's going to want to hire you on your resume. Mm -hmm. So Dina Mangini was my career advisor. And she told me, soldier, you need to change your email. I'm like, What's wrong with it? Well, read it. Combatkiller75 at gmail.com. Okay, like, you tell me, you think an employer is going to want to hire you with that email on your resume? Oh, <laughs> so, so now it's Rob Perez 7568 at gmail.com, and it's been that ever since. And it's helped me get jobs. Um, it's helped me transition out. But it's like every place that I worked, whether it was the, I did HR for three years, I did my nonprofit for two years. Uh, I've been everything to an admin assistant, office manager, human resources manager, human resources specialist, HR generalist. Um, shit, I even, I mean, I had odd jobs. Anything I could, I can get uh, just to keep, I've always worked since I was 16 years of age. And I, I just, after, life after the military was just so hard to hold a job, keep a job. So you know, I had to find another purpose, and that purpose was my nonprofit, Sarge Resource Center, which we ran successfully for two years, and we were able to be a service to over 1,400 veterans in that time span. Uh, resources services, we honored women veterans, we had events, we packed the house, we made an impact when COVID started. A lot of veteran organizations closed their doors. We were open, we were available, we were of service, we filled in the gap. Wow. And that's amazing, man. I was just thinking about everything you said in the last few minutes, just from trying to take your life four times to going and getting a master's degree and, and pulling yourself out of it and starting this nonprofit. Like that just, just that alone, what you accomplished within the last few minutes that you just talked about, um, should just let you know that you could really accomplish anything you want, right? You could pull yourself out of anything. Yeah, yeah. So recently, I because after the nonprofit, we we didn't really have the support of the funding. Um, I kind of shut it down after two years, and I moved up to Bakersfield, and in efforts to start all over again. I wanted to get out of LA, and we said, well, maybe it's not working for me here. Let's let's try something different. So I ended up working for Stockdale Country Club in Bakersfield for about three months. That didn't work out. 
Uh, but my buddy, Sergeant Mathis, that I deployed with, he's actually a state assemblyman in the Visalia area. And he gave me an opportunity to work as a, a district aide for his office for three months. And boy, I'll tell you what, that was a game changer because I felt like to be of service again for constituents, that was fucking badass because I was able to help them with their EDD cases. And these were backlogged from 2020, 2021, where they weren't even getting paid. I was able to resolve 22 cases of EDD uh, uh, payments that went out to those people that needed it. So that was that was a bonus. Um, I also helped veterans with their resources and services, directing them as a veteran. I knew exactly what where they can go to get VA claims and benefits for their uh, ID that says veteran, for their license plate that says uh, disabled veteran. So I was able to guide them and, and like, hey, go to the VFW, join the American Legion, join AMVETS. You know, or do you belong to it? No, well, maybe you should start, you know, try it out. You know, if you don't like it, try another one. So in that capacity, there I was being a service again. But my daughter, I have a, a seven-year-old and she lives with her mom in La Habra. So we had split and um, and that's why I, I left. But I was trying to come back and, and work things out and, and really just get my family back. And she has three kids and we had one together and, you know, that was my life. That was my, my passion and my dream was to recapture being a dad again. And in doing so, as I was coming back, the the housing situation didn't work out. So I've been staying in hotels. I stayed in a hotel in Brea last week. Right now I'm in Fullerton for this week. Next week I'm probably going to go to a different one. So And then I just lost my job with the state assembly because I transferred down here. So I was like, fuck, now what do I do? So one thing the Army does teach you is resilience. Uh, back then I probably would have tried to off myself again or something, but I found purpose and I figured, you know what, I'm still in the fight. There's still hope. There's still a chance. So I was able to apply with a different organization as a veteran peer specialist. And hopefully this Friday I hear back if I uh, get the job or not. So again, serving veterans has always been something I'm very good at. Now I got an opportunity to actually get paid for it. So we'll see how this goes along, but it's resiliency is one thing that we're taught in the military and you know, it's not until you get into these type of situations, you start to really pay attention to that yeah. and see what else can you do. It's not the, the fight's not over. I think I posted something about, you know, when, when, when life throws rocks at you, smash them down into dust and then wash your hands. Cause, uh, a lot of our veterans, we struggle with that kind of stuff. Yeah. Well, good luck, man, on that job. Keep you posted on that. No, definitely. Um, we're going to wrap it up, but, um, any last any last words before we cut the tape? No, sir. Just thank you for the opportunity to be out here and to tell my story. And, and hopefully this this can help a veteran in some way or form. Absolutely, man. Absolutely. You got an amazing story. Uh, thank you for being here, Robert. It's a big contribution to Urban Ballot or what we're doing right here. Um, you're definitely going to impact more than one person, man. So uh, appreciate it very much. Thanks, sir. Thank you. Push it to the limit. I can't go no more.